Well, if you have a Bible, let me invite you to open up to Romans chapter 8. I want to read one verse from Romans 8, and then I want us to turn to Revelation chapter 20. First, the good news. Hear the words of the living God. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you turn over to Revelation chapter 20, we'll begin reading at verse 11. These two are the words of God. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was no there was found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great standing before God and books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books the sea gave up the dead who were in it and Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life, where the names of the redeemed are written, was cast into the lake of fire. Again, may I say, these are the words of the living God. May those who have ears hear what the Spirit says to the church. You could be seated. Well, praise God, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ. Amen? That is the best news of all. And you know, there's two reasons. I'll tell you the other one in a minute. But here's the first reason I wanted to read from Revelation say, oh, okay, so there's no condemnation. No, no, there's condemnation that those who are in Christ will be exempted from because of Jesus. That's why we always say the good news is good, but if you don't know the bad news, how good is it? Many people in our world think everybody dies and goes to a better place. Listen, if you're not in Christ, this life is as close to heaven as you'll ever get. The good news is if you're in Christ, If you are in Christ, uh, this life is as close to hell as you'll ever get. No condemnation for those in Christ, but what about judgment? Does this mean there is no judgment? Here's what I want to talk about a little bit this morning, in fact, a lot bit. There's a difference between judgment and condemnation. If you're jotting down notes, We'll talk about that, and you fill those in in a minute. Judgment evaluates, gives a verdict, and might even pass sentence. Condemnation is one of the possible sentences. We've all watched legal shows, you know, we, the cops get the bad guy, and then the people in the district attorney's office say, "This is how do we have? We don't have enough to prosecute. You got to get more evidence, and so the cops have to do more work." and and then the DA's office says, finally, we can prosecute, but that's not over. Then they get to decide we're not only going to determine guilt or, or not guilty, but then the next phase is what about what the sentence going to be? And there's a lot of wrangling that goes over that kind of thing. Is it a death sentence? Is it a life sentence without possibility of parole? Is it, oh, by the way, I love the way they say, 25 consecutive life sentences. I I guess that's worse than like 24. I'm not sure. (laughs) While there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, there are judgments. And I want to take sort of a topical journey away from Romans chapter 8 this morning within the context of there is therefore now no condemnation to talk about four other judgments that the Bi- four judgments that the bible talks about and here's the first one if you're jotting down notes the judgment of sinners by god it's called the great white throne judgment we just read about it and at the great white throne judgment the result of that judgment is condemnation. 
absolute, utter condemnation culminating in the lake of fire, which burns forever. I'm sure that there's some who want, are expecting me to talk about the lake of fire, whether it's little, whether, whether it's literal, whether it's not. I'm not going to go there today. That's not our, our point. Reading Revelation 20, 11 through 15, wouldn't you agree? It's pretty self-explanatory. Now, you might say, what are the different books? You know, the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, the book of works. But the, the simple way is the book, of, the book of God's law sets the standard. The book of works tells what, how we've lived. And if we don't measure up to the standard, which only Christ did, there's condemnation. That's it. It's not that complicated. Those who are not in Christ, key, those who are not in Christ will be judged and this judgment at the great white throne judgment is the judgment regarding heaven or hell, and it's based on people's works, not their good works versus their bad works, not their good works or their bad works against anybody else's good or bad works, but all of their works, everything that someone has ever done compared to the absolute righteousness of Jesus Christ. And against that standard, who can stand? No one. No one can stand. But the good news is those who are in Christ, and I'm not going to tell you I know emphatically the answer to this question. Are they present at this and then declared not guilty? Or I don't know whether we're there or not. The Bible doesn't specifically say. But those who are in Christ, whether they're present for this judgment or not, when we are examined by God, because we are in Christ, that's such an important phrase that Paul uses over and over again, we are found to have not just not guilty, but the righteousness of Christ Jesus, which is, is more than just saying you didn't do anything bad. It means you did everything perfectly righteously, even as Jesus did. That's the judgment on those who are in Christ. That's why Jesus Christ died on the cross, is not only to forgive us of our sins, but to he rose from the dead to give us eternal life and his righteousness. So the first judgment that we want to be aware of that's in the Bible is actually the last judgment in the Bible, and that's the great white throne judgment. Here's the second one. Number two, Judgment of saints, circle that. This is just Christians. Judgment of saints, it's by God. He's the judge. Where is it? It's at the cross. And the results of that are what? Is what? Salvation. Real quickly, you know these three, many of you do, but we'll say them again because all three are equally important. Justification, which is freedom from the penalty of sin. That, that freedom from the penalty of sin, in God's eyes, is complete. And in our experience, it is complete. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Is there an amen in the house? The second phase of this, of this salvation, after justification, God's declaration, that is, is sanctification, which is freedom from the power of sin. And we've studied that at length in Romans chapter 6. To summarize it, those who are in Christ are no longer slaves to sin. We're slaves to righteousness. Instead of having sin as our master, we've got Christ as our master, and he's good, and he's... So we're no longer slaves. There's, there's no more power of sin in our lives. That is complete in God's eyes, though we're in process in our experience. I won't ask how many of you have completely overcome all sin in your life because I don't want to embarrass anybody saying, no, put your hand down. Because none of us have. Because in this life, we're in phase two of sanctification where God is growing us in his righteousness. But then, <laughs> praise God, <coughs> there's the third phase, which is glorification, which is freedom from the presence of sin. We'll be in heaven. There'll be no more temptation. Anybody been tempted enough in your life and troubled enough by temptation to think that sounds like really good news? No more temptation. And if there is no more temptation, what else is there? There is no more sin. You can stop confessing your sins when you're glorified because until then, we still struggle. 
So I, I say here it's complete in God's eyes as though it's already happened. The Word of God talks about our glorification in Romans chapter 8, which we will get to, as already being done, even though it has not happened yet in practice and is still yet future in our experience. First judgment that we talk about is the last judgment, the great white throne, which is the judgment of people before God, which results in condemnation. The second judgment is the judgment of saints by God. It took place at the cross. That's when it was finished, resulting in salvation. Here's the third one. This is also the judgment of saints. You can circle the word saints. When we say saints, we're not talking about people who some church said were special Christians. We're talking about all Christians. We are the saints of God, the ones who have been declared holy by his grace. The judgment of saints. Now, this is not by God. This is, this is by ourselves. As we judge ourselves during this life. Let me tell you a little bit about this judgment. We'll talk about what it results in in just a moment. But this judgment, which is ongoing, where we are to judge ourselves, write this down. We are to judge ourselves, not each other. We're to judge ourselves, not each other. Now, Jesus' warning about judging others does not mean we are to make no evaluation of anything. We are to evaluate our lives before the standard of God's word. And there are times, hold on with me, there are times when we have to make a myriad of judgments and evaluations of hundreds of things every day. Constantly, we must do that. What we're not to do in this, this judging of ourselves is condemn. There's, again, the difference between judgment and condemn. Judgment is looking at things. That's why I use the word evaluate. Evaluate this reality. Condemnation is past sentence. We're, that's not our job. That belongs to God alone. By the way, we're not to judge ourselves or condemn, well, excuse me, we are to judge ourselves. We're not to condemn ourselves. Why? Because there's no, for, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So if you are condemning yourself, child of God, you're going against what God says. Judge yourself, and we're going to talk about that in just as we go, but don't condemn yourself. And for heaven's sake, even when you need to make evaluations of other people, which sometimes we do need to, we are in no place to pass condemnation. This is why we may we say this person isn't a believer. We can say he, this person renounces faith in Christ, has nothing to do with Christ, and so it's safe to say they have declared themselves to not be a believer. But when it comes to people who are believers, at, at best we can say we don't know. They call themselves Christians, but they don't live like Christians. One of Satan's favorite verses, I'm sure he's got many, he knows the Bible better than any of us. One of his favorite verses, twisted, of course, because that's what Satan does with the scriptures, is Rome, or excuse me, Matthew 7, 1. If you don't know the address, you'll recognize it as soon as I give you the first two words. Judge not, lest ye be judged. This verse does not mean make no evaluations. It means make no what? Condemnation. We're in no place to condemn others. We, may, we have to make evaluations, or if you want to call them judgments, without condemnation. We have to do this all the time. Jesus even told us what the criteria of that judgment is. In verse 16 of Matthew chapter 7, he says, By their fruit you'll know them. Why would he tell us how to evaluate if we weren't supposed to do it? There's a, in chapter 7, there are many, many verses about how to make judgments righteously. There are some verses about how not to make judgments unrighteously. But people, especially the devil, never get past the first two words of the chapter, judge not, which many people means I can do anything to anybody at any time and no one can ever judge me. No, no, no. We, we have to make evaluations. Heaven help, for instance, heaven help the person who does not evaluate a person before saying, I do at the altar. You better be making some evaluations. And not just is this a good guy or a bad guy, not just is she cute and funny or not cute and funny, not just does he make a lot of money or does she make enough to support me. 
What about, what about whether or not they really love the Lord? I didn't say whether they go to church and have a Bible. I know people who have married, Christians, who have married someone because they, well, she has a Bible. Yeah, but does she read it? Does she own it? Is it anything, you know what I'm saying? We have to make judgments. And then even beyond that, even as Christians, look at there are differences of opinions among Christians which could really get in the way of a happy household. Little things like how do we raise our children? How do we understand what the Bible says about children, et cetera, et cetera? So we must make evaluations. We are to judge ourselves to see whether or not we're in the faith, according to Paul in, first, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Judge yourselves to see whether or not you're in your faith, in the faith. Judge ourselves in order to discipline ourselves, in order to avoid sin in our lives, in order to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3, 18. We are to evaluate without condemning others in love in order to discern what or whom we should unite with, not just in marriage, in business. There's so many things. We do have to pass judgments. We just are in no place to condemn people. There's a difference. The person who makes no judgments is a fool. The person who makes jo no judgments drinks the Kool-Aid. Not a good idea. We are to evaluate a lot of things without condemning. We're to evaluate others, the Bible says, in order to stir up love and good works. What does it say? Consider one another. What does that mean? You've got to give some thought to what your brothers and sisters are up to so that we can give words of encouragement, so we can stir up love and good works in one another. That's Hebrews 10, 24. We must refrain not from evaluating, but from condemning. We're in no place to look down on someone, even if we say, you know, we don't know whether they're a Christian. They say they are, but they don't live like it. We're not going to marry them, but we're in no position to condemn them. That's God's job. Condemnation belongs to God alone. Now, in the first two, I said, these, here's the judgment. It's by God, and here's what it results in. So this third one, here's the judgment. It's we are to judge ourselves, and we do judge others because we have to make some evaluations in order to get along in this life. What is the result of judging ourselves? Let's just deal with that. Three things. There could be many more that we'll have, but I'll, I'll give you three. The first one, judging ourselves will result in, A, lives that please God. Now, he's pleased with you because you're in Christ, but that doesn't mean he's excited and endorsing everything you and I do. Would you agree with that? He can't endorse our sin. It doesn't make him, oh, good, they're sinning some more. He doesn't do that. He loves us, but the lives of people who are judging themselves to see whether they're in the faith, in other words, they're scrutinizing their own lives, their own mouths, their own hearts, will live lives that are pleasing to God. Revelation 4.11 says we were created for something in specific, and that's to please God. We were created for God's pleasure. When we judge ourselves, if it is in order to discipline ourselves, in order to turn from sin, in order to grow spiritually, that's pleasing to God. He loves you anyway because of Christ. But think about it. Think with me for a second here. Are you and am I looking at our lives on a regular basis and say, am I living a life that is pleasing to God? That's judging ourselves in a good way. And the result will be a life that pleases God, so long as we act on it. Here's the second one, B, lives that validate our profession of faith or validate our testimonies. When we fail to judge ourselves, we will not live rightly. By the way, usually you can tell who's on that path is the person who's really quick to say, don't judge me, don't judge me. You know why they're saying that? They don't want to be judged by anybody because they're not judging themselves. Don't judge me, don't judge me, don't judge me. Would you agree with this statement if we fail to judge ourselves? We're probably not living rightly. It doesn't mean we're living in gross immorality or gross sin. We're not serial killers or anything like that, maybe. But when we're not living rightly, you know what we do? We invalidate our testimony. We invalidate our profession of faith. Jesus said in John 13, 35, our lives are to bear testimony that we are Christ's disciples. 
How's your life doing on that? I mean, apart from the, the mandate that we're to go and make disciples of all nations and preach the gospel, et cetera, et cetera, in addition to that, how we live matters. Why should they listen to what we say about Christ if it doesn't look like we love him and follow him? Let me just ask you this. Would we do better at our testimony before the world who's looking at us and is judging us? Would we do better if we judged ourselves more? Oh, but more. Would we do better if we judged others less? Probably both are true. There's no condemnation for those in Christ, but there are judgments. There's, there's the judgment of those who are not in Christ, and then there is the judgment that was put on those who are in Christ, which is already done, results in salvation. And now we have to judge ourselves, and we have to be very careful about judging others. Unfortunately, even though our lives are supposed to be a testimony that we are Christ's disciples, our unity, according to Jesus in John 17, is a testimony that he's the Son of God how well we get along with each other. Unfortunately, Christians are also the biggest reason, humanly speaking, that people do not believe that Jesus is God and that we are his disciples. Just again, it's just interesting that things come up in the prayer meetings before the service that um, it's like, so were you reading my notes? Somebody was praying and I, th I was just saying, amen, amen. Someone in my group was was praying for people who are professing faith in Christ, but who don't go to church anymore because they got a beef with somebody. And I love the person praying for that, help them get past that. Listen, the reason why we're in the body of Christ is so we can learn to forgive others. Because if you, can't, you come to church to be treated perfectly by God's people, you don't get it. We are treated perfectly by God. But none of us treats everybody perfectly, probably anybody, and every one of us is going to have our toes stepped on from time to time. And you're never more like Jesus Christ than when you are forgiving those who have wronged you. You want to be like Christ? Forgive sin. Forgive when other people don't treat you the way you like. So we need to judge ourselves in order to validate our profession of faith, in order to say, yes, we are Christians in our lives testify of that. Here's a third one, and I'll stop with three. And I love this, because this is such an important topic. Those who judge themselves, judging ourselves will result in assurance of salvation. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. By the way, this is 1 John 2, 3, 4, and 5. By this, we know we know him, if we keep his commandments. Those who say, I know him and do not keep his commandments are not in the faith. That's the word of God judging, not me. Now, I want you to listen very closely. After saying that, I say that if we judge ourselves to scrutinize ourselves for discipline, to avoid sin, and to grow in grace, we'll have assurance of salvation. Okay, here, make sure you don't miss this next sentence. Salvation is by God's grace alone. By God's grace alone. We have no reason to believe that we've received God's grace if we're not living like Christians, though. Talk is cheap. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I got a Bible. I, I, I obey God. No, you don't. None of us do. You know what follows a new birth? New life. I wasn't planning on working this in, but just now it came to me. There's this little tiny itty bitty person that just came into my life this week. It's grandchild number 13. Heloise, don't you love that name? <laughs> We're so glad that the birth worked out because it was not easy. It was a brand new life. A brand new life ahead of this child. I'm looking at this child and I'm thinking, I remember when this child was born, the first grandchild, and, and I... And now I look, there's a whole life that follows. Listen, if you're born again as a child of God, then you have a life to live as a child of God. Not perfectly. None of us do. But there's a difference. Be Listen, if the only difference between you and your neighbor is you go to church on Sunday, you better check your spiritual pulse. If we're Christians, we think differently. We act differently. 
It's as we judge ourselves and respond to our sin by confessing and repenting of sin that we have reason for assurance. And by the way, just a little footnote on that. One of the other encouragements that I tell people, be encouraged when you feel convicted by your sin, that is evidence that you're a child of God because the people in the world don't care about their sin. But if you're troubled by your sin, good. Confess and repent and know that you're forgiven because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do not misunderstand this point about assurance. Salvation, I think this is in your notes, Salvation is not based on how we live, but in part, assurance is. At least we can't, at least we can say, if you're living in sin, you have no, no validation to be assured of your salvation. Here's the fourth judgment. Judgment of saints, Christians, this is Christians, by God, when we die, that's number four. And what does it result in? Reward or loss of reward. What is it not about? Heaven and hell. Why is it not about heaven and hell? Because that was already settled at the cross if you're a child of God. Hallelujah. So let's talk about this business of being rewarded in heaven. I can remember hearing a song as a young Christian, you know, so much bad theology in Christian music sometimes. There's good stuff, don't get me wrong. But I can remember a song, I don't even, I'm glad I don't remember who it is. That way I won't be tempted to condemn them or judge them. But the song said, I don't care if I'm a rock in heaven so long as I get there. That is bad theology. That's the theology of a person who says, well, I got a saved soul. I'm going to live a useless life and go to heaven and everything will be just fine. That's not the way to live. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. We're not going to read it, but I wrote all these verses down for you. Specifically in the verse are the words, the judgment seat of Christ. This judgment, again, is not about heaven or hell. Why? That was determined at the cross when Jesus took our hell in order to give us his heaven. The judgment seat of of Christ is about rewards or the loss of reward. How does this judgment take place? Well, here's a couple verses that help us understand. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that also shall he reap. Does that kind of tell you this has to do with yeah. whoever sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Whoever sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. He's talking about Christians as well. Sowing and reaping is a concept in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, and I'll read my lips. It's not the same as karma. Too many Christians, without realizing, walking around thinking life is karma. If anything goes wrong, well, I must have done something. If everything goes right, well, I guess I'm okay. No, neither one of those are the reason why. Listen, God is, is judging, and the good news is he does so righteously, and the really good news is sometimes when he judges us, he gives us grace instead of what we deserve. Amen? If you read the bulletin, the front of the bulletin this week, it talks about the worst king of Judah, Manasseh. The worst king of Judah. I don't think there's any doubt that he was the worst king of the nation of Judah in the Bible. It even says he was more wicked than the pagan nations that Israel was sent to displace. He offered his children as live burnt sacrifices. God judged him, sent him to Assyria. Uh, that's pretty bad. That's like close to going to hell, I guess. But he went to Assyria, and while he was there, he cried out to God, and God saved him and brought him back and let him be king again. There is no writer in Hollywood, on strike or otherwise, who could come up with a story this good. So he's a new man. He's a changed man. I'm going to make a difference. And so he lived righteously, and he tried to lead his, I say tried, tried to lead his nation to repentance, but they followed their king's, the example of their king's sin, 
better than they followed the example of their king's repentance. The nation did not follow Manasseh. He died with honor because he was saved, but the the consequences followed. The nation was still wicked and evil, even though one man repented. And then to top it off, his son Ammon became king, lasted two years and was assassinated. That's a good way to go out, huh? Because he followed his father's footsteps in unrighteousness, not in righteousness. See, sometimes even when we're forgiven, who, who can give an amen to this? Sometimes we still have to suffer the consequences. You know, you jump off a tall building and on the way down say, what have I done? I repent, splat. It's, it's not going to change the, the condition of the pavement. That's a gross, quick type of example. But you know what? How many of us, even today, I don't even want to think about this, but how many of us today are still swimming in the backwash of past sins, not because God is condemning us, but because we set certain things in motion. And God has been pleased by his perfect righteousness not to reverse the consequences on something. Sometimes, sometimes he does, but there's no guarantee. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 and 24, a passage about going to work. A lot of people can relate to this. You go to work, your boss is a nut. Everybody's boss is a nut. If you're a boss, some people think you're a nut. Um, but that passage on being a good employee as a Christian says that God is the rewarder, not your boss. How come I was passed over for uh, this raise or this promotion? Maybe your boss is a nut, but God's ultimately the one in control and the reward comes from him. We, were, we are rewarded by God. God is the judge, and his, this ensures perfect judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 15 talks about our works will be tested by fire. This is back to the actual judgment seat of Christ. And I want to just add to this, it's not just what we did, but it's how we did things or how we are doing things. And here's the deal. God tests and judges even our motivations. Even good things can be burned in the fire if not done with, imp with proper motives. If you do good things and hope everybody notices and pat you on the back and congratulates you, there's your reward. Don't expect any from God. Or if you do good things and complain about it the whole time and wish you didn't have to do good things, don't expect much reward from God. There goes your <laughs> in the fire. Now, you say, well, then why should I do good things? because God wants you to do good things. Just don't stop doing good things. Stop doing them with a bad attitude. That's the difference. And rewarded for what? And I'll give you a short list, not an exhaustive list. Psalm 1911, for keeping God's word. We're to hear it. We're to read it. We're to study it. We're to memorize it. We're to, to, to meditate on it. We're to own it. This is, to be, this is the sieve through which we, the filter through which we filter everything that comes into our lives and everything that goes out of our lives has got to be from the word of God, the word of God, the word of God. This is why, listen, this is why Christians need to be in church every single week that they can possibly be in church. And the reason why is because no sermon, at least from this pulpit, is going to change anybody's life. But what changes our lives is consistently hearing the word of God over and over and over and over and over and over again. He promises reward for keeping God's word. He promises reward, Proverbs 13, 13, to those who fear the word of God, not just keep it and obey it, but who fear it. I love this, Isaiah 66, 2. But on this one will I look, this is God speaking, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, wait for it, and who trembles at my word. This is God saying, I will reward those who tremble at my word. In Matthew chapter 24, this is the, the, the judgment where he says, you didn't visit me. You didn't help me. He said, when did we ever see you in need? Well, as much as you didn't do it for the least of these, my brothers, you didn't do it to me. Oh, but over here, you, I'm going to reward you for doing this for me, for doing this for me. For doing... And the people say, oh, but Lord, when did we do that for you? Is every time you did it for someone else, you were doing it for me. God promises reward for those who serve. 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Serving is to be seen and rewarded by God, not for man. Once again, back to motives. If you're doing what you do to be seen and patted on the back, who wants to have a plaque on your name, a plaque of your wall in the name of a church saying this, you know, this pew or God forbid, you know, the birdbath in the garden is dedicated to so-and-so. You know what? Just do it and let God's eyes be on what you do and let God's reward be enough. Hebrews 11.6, one of my, again, favorite verses I'm not going to read and go into it, but just seeking the Lord himself and not just his blessings. If you seek God's blessings, you may get them, you may not. You seek the Lord, you'll get more than his blessings, you'll get him. Reward with what? Crowns. Jot it down. Crowns. That's what the Bible talks about. It's, It's illustrative. It's not literally, here's a crown. You say, oh... This one's too big, you know, and it's down on my nose, or this one's too small. No, no. It's figuratively. I'll give you four different crowns, and there's others talked about in the Bible, but here's some. James 1, verse 12, the crown of life, eternal life to those who endure to the end, particularly those who are martyred. 1 Corinthians 9, 25, an imperishable crown, not a wreath or a gold medal, not even a cash prize, an imperishable crown. I had a trophy for coaching a football team in 1971. The seven broke, so it said 19, crooked one with a one, and I still kept it. It was busted. It was broken. The team picture, all curled up. Remember all the pictures in the 70s, they all turned colors later on? You're going to get an imperishable crown. It's never going to wear out. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, a crown of righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. They'll be crowned. 1 Peter 5, 4, a crown of glory. Again, what were we created for? To glorify God. So now we get to this, and this is really the grand finale What will we do with our rewards? I know many of you know this. Revelation 4.10 says we will cast our crowns, all of our rewards that he gives us, we will cast all of our crowns at at his feet. Why is that? Because all that we do that is worthy of any reward at all, we've done by the grace of God. The Lord graciously rewards his saints according to how we lived. This has nothing to do with salvation which is by grace and not performance. Truth be told, every righteous deed done with righteous motives is done by the grace of God. Therefore, the rewards belong to him and not us. So he gives us these rewards in heaven and we cast all of our crowns at the feet of the Lord Jesus. When we receive these rewards in heaven, we will look at, we won't be able to peel our eyes off of his face. I'm sure of that. We're going to be seeing Jesus' face. We're going to be seeing the face of God in his full glory. And we're going to have a crown on our heads, hopefully maybe several. And we're going to look at him and we're going to see how glorious he is. And then we're going to ask this simple question, what is this crown doing on my head? This in all of its glory, is not even worthy to go on his head. It goes beneath his feet. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. Heaven or hell was determined for God's people at the cross, not based on anything we do before or after we're born again. There is, therefore, now no condemnation. Once we're saved, however, we must judge ourselves. And when we die, we will be judged, not regarding heaven or hell, but regarding rewards or loss thereof. And at that time, God will reward his people with crowns based on how we lived and on our motives. But when we see him in his glory... We will, without prompting, spontaneously cast our crowns at his feet because he alone 
is worthy of glory. Well, this was a lot of stuff to chew on. That's why I put all the verses in there. You can look them up. It's important that we know that though there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, there are still judgments talked about in the Bible. I hope you do really well first at judging yourself and second at the great white, excuse me, at the uh, seat of, judgment seat of Christ that you will be rewarded because of God's grace in your life. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us salvation. Thank you for filling us with your spirit. Father, please give us the grace, the wisdom to judge ourselves that we be not judged. And thank you, Jesus, for taking the ultimate judgment and condemnation for those you came to save, we who have trusted in Jesus, who have trusted in Jesus because of his grace. Amen.